Welcome to Nous, the podcast where we tackle the deepest questions about the mind. If you're enjoying the show, then don't forget to leave a rating or a nice review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using. If you want to get in touch with me or join the conversation with other listeners, you can track me down on Twitter at NS the Podcast. And that's all the boring stuff done. Enjoy. In this episode, I'm honoured to welcome a celebrated neuroscientist whose latest book is a work of quite staggering ambition and scope. It's called The Deep History of Ourselves, the four billion year story of how we got conscious brains. This epic story provides a kind of narrative structure from which emerge the author's distinctive answers to questions like, what do we have in common with the earliest forms of life? How did sophisticated cognition arise? Why do we feel emotion? And what makes us conscious? He is definitely not afraid to tackle the big questions. Speaking to me from New York, Professor Joseph Ledoux, welcome to Naus. Thank you for having me. It's it's a delight. Now, it, it feels that the book is like a culmination of a whole career's worth of work, where you bring together ideas that you've been developing for many years. Is that how you see it? Well, yes, it uh, it is a big picture kind of book, but um, I couldn't have written this book if I hadn't made all of the, the steps that I've made in my work and my thinking about the problem. So it, it's really just a continuation of my last book, Anxious, which is a continuation of my last, you know, it's just like, uh, it just moves on in the, some of the themes, if you've read the other books, you'll recognize themes that have been there all the way. In fact, most of the the big ideas I have, I I started out with, and I didn't start out with in graduate school, but I got them in graduate school by studying uh, split brain patients that kind of set me on the path of thinking about consciousness, and I put that aside for a while to get into lab work. Um, but it's always been there as an undercurrent in all my books and in my writings. It's fascinating that you you started your graduate work as a PhD student. Uh, and uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Is it Michael Gazaniga? Gazaniga, yes. that? Gazaniga, that's right. Um, working on split brain patients. H- how did you sort of manage to to start working on that? That was must have been some of the most exciting work that was happening at the time. Well, it was, um, you know, different different uh, fields have their ebbs and flows, and that was a, a pretty interesting topic in psychology and uh, in the very young field of neuroscience uh, at the time. And I came into it sort of through the back door. I had I had two degrees in business administration, which um, <laughs> was not appealing that much to me. <laughs> and the only thing I found interesting um, was taking psychology courses and trying to figure out a little bit of why people buy the stuff they buy, and you know how they could be better protected from uh, advertising and so forth. Mm. So I had a little bit of a background in psychology, and I took a class with a, uh, a professor who happened to be studying. Uh, what he called motivation and learning, and I thought that sounded good. So um, it turned out what he was studying was how the brain, how the rat brain learns about visual stimuli. And so I worked in his lab a little bit, and you know, I, I was just totally blown away with the idea that you could even study the brain, having grown up in a small town in Louisiana and not having been exposed to anything like you know brain research. I guess a lot of people weren't exposed to brain research back then. But it was it was an eye opening experience and just you know I found it uh, obviously fascinating. I think everybody's fascinated with the brain. Mm. And back then there was so you know this, it wasn't a household word. Neuroscience was not something it didn't even exist as a field that only came along officially in like the early seventies. So anyway, we um, I, I did a couple of studies with him and I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to graduate school uh, in that field. And uh, he knew someone at the State University of New York at Stony Brook on Long Island. So I applied there and I was accepted. I applied to a bunch of other places, but having no background, I wasn't accepted anywhere. So I was fortunate to get in there and I had no idea what I was going to do. And I just met a graduate student of Mike Asanigas and found out a little bit about that work and decided, well, that sounds great. And Mike said, okay, sure, why not join? 
Fantastic. So, so um, what's the sort of overall shape of your career? So you started out, so it was business, then it was learning and memory and motivation, I think you said. Well, that was, that was just a, a short time. A yeah, short but, time. Yeah. Then, then the work on split brain patients, which right. we should probably explain at some point, but maybe a little bit later, because okay. um, I, I did an interview with uh, Patricia Churchland recently as well, and, and she cited the split brain work oh, as, okay. as something that was a, a sort of major influence and inspiration to her when she was starting out. Um, uh, and then, and then there was a lot of um, I don't know how to describe it more uh, focused, more fundamental work on brain circuits to do with. Uh, survival in and fear in rats, right? That's correct. And then sort of re-emerging back to really big picture stuff um, with all of that detailed work in the background. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, that's that's pretty good. I mean, there there are a couple of things I I would add. The um, the reason I got into the the rat work um, after you know, the reason I went back to the rat work after the split brain work is because. In the split brain patients, and maybe I can say a word about what those are now. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. So, so a split brain patient is someone whose brain has been literally sectioned in half. The two cerebral hemispheres, the top parts where the cortex is, have been cut in half. That means that the interconnections, the fibers, the axons that go between the two sides and allow the two sides to integrate and, and be coordinated um, are sectioned. And the reason this is done is to relieve intractable epilepsy that can't be helped with medications or any other methods that uh, that were available at the time. And so in, in a few rare cases, the surgery was done. It was done in a group of patients in California in the late 50s and early, maybe it was the early 60s, uh, that my mentor, Mike Zaniga, had the uh, fortune to, a good fortune to uh, do his PhD research on. And then after that, he uh, he moved to the East Coast and you know, he didn't have patients, so he was doing other things. Uh, but at some point, another group of patients came along being operated on at Dartmouth Medical School. And Mike um, was asked if he would like to test those patients. And it was right about that time that I had joined his lab. And so it was a kind of, uh, um, you know, convergence of events that was really fortunate for me because I got into uh, neuroscience in a very sort of light way. I, you didn't need to know a lot about the brain to test these patients, the left, right, front, back. To, the tasks, the methods were very simple. You'd make visual slides that you could present stimuli to one side of space or the other so that it would go to the left or the right hemisphere. We were able to put information into one side of the brain or the other. And all of that had been done before. So we knew what, you know, when information goes to the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere, which typically has language, is not able to talk about that information. Yet the left hand connected to the right hemisphere can reach into a bag uh, or behind a screen and pull out the stimulus that matches the one that had been um, shown to the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But because that stimulus is isolated from the left hemisphere, where we, we speak in most cases, um, the left hemisphere, the patient could not speak about it, couldn't give a verbal report about what the stimulus is. So that led to the idea uh, in, the, in the first set of patients that maybe there are two kind of mental systems, one in each hemisphere. Not all the time, but when the brain has been sectioned like this, that, cre that almost by default creates two mental uh, systems that uh, function somewhat independently. I mean, if I, if, I was, if I was to be sort of crude, I think one of the very eye-catching uh, things about these experiments is they kind of suggest when you sever the commissures between the hemispheres, your different hemispheres are maybe supporting distinct kind of consciousnesses. That's, that's the kind of, uh, I guess, the crude way of, of describing why it's of so sort of striking significance, right, to a lot of people. And, you know, that, that topic has been debated quite a bit. We got a little bit of, of new information about that, though, in this new set of patients. So, as I said, the, the basic stuff about, you know, isolating information in the two hemispheres from, from each other um, was already done in the, in the 60s in California. So in, in this group of patients, we decided we wanted to look at something else, not the consequences of taking the brain apart, but what the consequences are for the normal operation of the brain. In other words, can we use this as a model um, of try to understand how the brain interacts normally, how the two sides interact normally to give rise to our mental unity and so forth. 
So just a quick example of, of one of the experiments we did that, that ended up being, you know, talked about quite a bit. Um, we would put, we'd put two stimuli, one in each visual field, left visual field, right visual field, and that sends it to the opposite hemisphere. So in this one particular case, uh, in this famous example that's been talked about quite a bit, the um, uh, one side of the brain saw a snow scene and the other side saw a chicken claw. Okay. And <clears throat> so the two hands reached out and each pointed to the appropriate stimulus. Okay, so the right hand is, is controlled by the left, left hemisphere, hemisphere right? speaks. which is the language hemisphere. So the left hemisphere yeah. saw a chicken, and so yeah. he says, I pointed to the chicken claw because, you know, it goes with the chicken, and I picked the shovel. This is now the left hemisphere is talking about the response performed the, by the right hemisphere. I, I picked the shovel with my left hand because if you have chickens, you've got to clean up the chicken shed. <sighs> So he, what he did was he took two pieces of information out in his world that he couldn't integrate in his brain, but used his behavioral responses to generate a narrative about why he might have generated that response. So, so our explanation is that the right brain, the right hemisphere is seeing the snow scene and matching the shovel with the snow scene. Um, but the, the left hemisphere is doing the talking right. and the left hem hemisphere doesn't have the information about the snow scene because right. it didn't the the visual information wasn't presented to the left hemisphere so the left hemisphere is making up stuff to explain the behavior of the left hand is that that's right, right. Of the right that's hemisphere. right on the basis of what the right hand and the left hemisphere did so the left hemisphere knows what it did and it generates a story about what the right hemisphere did based on what it sees externally. So we monitor our behavior and use that as a, a source of kind of keeping our mental systems together. You know, what, where we went with that was that we proposed in, in seeing all this that one of the systems that might be generating these non-conscious behaviors in our daily life, you know, a lot of what we do daily on a daily basis is not necessarily fully conscious, but we're generating all kinds of behaviors uh, and only after the fact do we have access to it? Mm. So we propose that maybe so-called emotion systems might be one of these non-conscious systems subcortically, for example, that might be generating behaviors that we have to consciously kind of put together a narrative about in order to understand our emotional life. Great. Okay. Well, that I think that gives us a, a preview of where we're headed kind of almost at the end of this story. Um, certainly the idea of consciousness or important parts of consciousness as mostly observing as fairly passive in, in is some, something you write about in the book. But let's just let, let's just start at the beginning with the kind of the whole vision. Can you explain why you think we need a, a deep history? So you use the word deep in the title right. um, very deliberately. Why do you think that's an essential part of understanding human consciousness, cognition, human mental life? You know, I'll tell you the, the thought processes that got me there. When I left the, the split brain work and started doing, I turned to, to rodent studies to try and study some subcortical systems that generate you know, affectively, emotionally significant responses, um, because I thought that those might be the kinds of things that we consciously then interpret. And because those parts of the brain are highly conserved between humans and rodents, by studying these defensive behaviors, like a rat that's uh, exposed to a threatening stimulus will freeze, its blood pressure goes up. By studying this, we could maybe learn something about our brains as well, because the, the um, we do the same thing in the presence of danger. So, uh, you know, we did a lot of research on this in the 1980s and 90s, identifying the amygdala as a key structure that is involved in, in the learning about danger and in the uh, control of responses uh, to danger, these hardwired responses like freezing or, or, or running away or whatever. So the amygdala is an important structure or circuits in the amygdala are important for receiving information about the external world and triggering these kinds of responses. So one of the steps that we took next, the field neuroscience in general was becoming more molecular in the, uh, in the 1990s and a lot of information was be being learned about 
uh, how molecules in different systems of the brain work. And one of the systems that was of particular interest to many people was the um, uh, were systems that make our memories. Mm. And so there was a lot of research both in um, in rodents and uh, mice, mice and rats, but also in invertebrates like slugs and snails and flies looking for the molecules that were relevant. It was much easier to do in the invertebrates because their, their nervous systems are so simple. And so researchers like Eric Kendall at Columbia University, who received the Nobel Prize for this work on memory molecules, um, was able to identify a set of molecules, a set of proteins that are very important for the establishment of, um, of, of memories in these invertebrate organisms. Um, the molecules turned out to be the same in many cases as those that were being discovered in invertebrates. Mm. So how do flies and, and slugs get the same molecules in their brain as mammals? And so to answer that question, you have to find, and you know, I hadn't, I really hadn't thought about it much. I just said, okay, it's the same. And somehow it, uh, it evolved uh, in parallel, but I hadn't asked how that evolved. And I had uh, become friendly with um, Seth Grant, who was uh, at one point a postdoc in Eric Kandel's lab. But Seth was very interested in the evolution of, of all of this. And from him, I learned when I was on sabbatical at, at Cambridge, I learned a lot about the evolutionary history of, of these molecules. And he, um, what he was able to show is that the ancestor that uh, made all this possible, in other words, the ancestor that, the, that is common to you know, invertebrates like flies and bugs and slugs, and the ancestor of, of mammals, the, of, these converge or these come together or began uh, with an early bilateral organism. Mm. So that's, bugs have a, a bilateral body, left, right, front, back, and um, you know, vertebrates do as well. So the connection is that there's an inver there's a very ancient invertebrate that is the origin of both of those lines, both mm. what we typically call invertebrates, but also of the vertebrates. And how how ancient how ancient are we talking? Here? And, you know, we're talking you know six or seven hundred million years ago. Okay. okay. And so that's before there were really any other animals. So the, this is called the last common bilateral ancestor. So before that, the only things that existed in the animal kingdom were sponges and, uh, and jellyfish-like organisms. These didn't have bilateral bodies. So this bilateral organism gave rise to one line that uh, ended up becoming what's called invertebrates and the other line becoming vertebrates. Now there are steps in between there that we'll, we'll just kind of brush over, but the key difference in the two lines is embryological. In other words, it depends on whether in early life, very early life, whether the embryo, the digestive system in the embryo develops with the mouth as the first opening or the anus as the first opening. Mm. The classic invertebrates that we've been talking about um, have the uh, mouth first pattern, whereas the invertebrates that gave rise to the vertebrates have the anus first pattern. So that is the, the deep connection to the vertebrates and invertebrates that we that we mostly share the earth with today. The point is that that takes us back, you know, say six or seven hundred million years ago. But then the question is, and Seth pursued this as well, Seth Grant, you know, how does it go further? And so he collected data uh, showing that the uh, the same molecules that are underlying a very important mechanism for learning and memory in all these other organisms the NMDA receptor, N-methyl D aspartate receptor, which is you know, the, the plasticity molecule, the plasticity receptor in the brain, mm. um, has components that are present in single cell protozoa. Wow. So they don't have a nervous system. They don't have any other cell. They're just one cell. And yet they possess some of these kind of precursors to the NMDA receptor. And if you begin to look at um, you know where these guys came from, these protozoa, the protozoa belong to a class of organisms called protists. So one class of protists are the protozoa, and they gave rise to animals. Another class, green algae, gave rise to plants. And a third class gave rise to fungi. So three of these protists 
uh, gave rise to all of the organisms that we inhabit the uh, the earth with now. Astonishing. So, so there are chemical messengers that our brains depend on that we have in common with organisms uh, that were around, uh, well, we, you were talking about 600, 700 million Well, now we're ago. talking um, 2, million, uh, 2 billion. Uh, 2 billion. Now we've gone all the way back 2 billion, yeah. I guess. So you, so you were studying rat brains, then you were starting to look into molecular mechanisms uh, governing the activity and behavior in those in those brain circuits, and then discovered and realized in your work with Seth Grant that um, that these mechanisms are ancient uh, evolutionarily, and so you you were you were starting to learn more about uh, about them by tracing their evolutionary lineage, or were you just did, did it throw up new insights by understanding that evolutionary context, or was it just a sort of uh, you know a trail of curiosity of understanding? At that where point, it was a trail of curiosity. You know, I wasn't mm. planning to you know start studying protozoa or anything. Mm. But the uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing about it is that they also learn protozoa. Mm. They have a, a actual, actually a rich uh, behavioral repertoire. They um, Now, just to be clear, we have protozoa now, don't we? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, you know, intestinal parasites are, par are protozoa. Are protozoa. Yeah, so, so they're evolutionarily ancient, but they're still around. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and so, you know, they get through their day by detecting danger. They can. Uh, they have to incorporate nutrients. They have. They're one cell. They have to balance the fluids and ions in that cell. So you know, if, if too much salt comes in, um, if they don't have the right salt concentration, they either explode or contract. Uh, and they also reproduce. So those are four important things that happen in our daily lives: Defect, detecting danger, eating, drinking, and reproducing. Well, we guess we don't do it every day, but uh, sometimes we reproduce. So, um, so that that was kind of, and they, as I said, they learn. They can, if they are moving towards something that's toxic, uh, they can detect that, and they can associate stimuli with the uh, with that, and you know, modify their behavior. One thing that did blow me away that I discovered in your book was you said also bacteria. There's some evidence that certain forms of bacteria might have rudimentary forms of learning and memory that they're capable of, which was staggering to me. It's just so surprising. Yeah. So, the, I mean, that's, you know, I, I think I probably got the, uh, the behavioral information about bacteria first because it was more, uh, there's more of it. But, you know, we don't stop with protozoa. We'd have to go back another step to the origin of, of protozoa. And the origin of protozoa are these bacterial-like organisms that go back 3.8 billion years. And they do all those things too. They detect danger, they incorporate nutrients, balance fluids and ions, and reproduce. What, what, what sort of, what, what are we talking about when we're, we're talking about a bacteria exhibiting learning and the memory? They, they don't have a nervous system in the first place, right? So it's very simple and primitive. And it's not based on neural networks, but molecular networks. Mm -hmm. So these molecules um, on the surface of the, uh, the, mem the membrane on the surface of the cell are able to pick up environmental cues related to the presence of toxicity or to the presence of uh, nutrition and benefit from that in future encounters. So at this point, the evidence of bacterial learning is not firmly established. But all of the other organisms obviously do it. So my quest started with the question of how, you know, when I started get learn, and one thing I missed uh, saying earlier was that the reason I started going back and back and back, it was to figure out how far back the detection and response to danger goes. And I didn't get to the end until I got to the beginning of life. <laughs> so until you got to uh, Luca. I believe that's right. Yeah. Last common, last universal common ancestor. Okay, so 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 let's just um, pull out explicitly what um, what do we have in common with Luca? Um, we detect danger, we reproduce, we incorporate nutrients and balance fluids and ions. Those things are requirements of survival. But when we do those things, we have mental states, and so we think that their purpose is somehow related to these mental states. But um, what this deep look at things tells us uh, 
is that the reason we do these things is the same reason the bacteria do these things. We detect and respond to danger to keep us alive. And you know, if we, if we actually look at how the human brain does this, on the base, given the work we've done in rats and then you know, parallel studies in humans, what we see is that the amygdala, for example, is involved in the detection and the response to danger in both rats and humans. And so the assumption is that the reason the rat is freezing in the presence of danger, and therefore a human is freezing in the presence of danger, is because the rat feels fear. Because when we respond to danger, we feel fear. When we freeze, we're almost always, you know, when we're freezing or running away, we're almost always experiencing fear. But what it's looking like in terms of newer research is that that's a misunderstanding. It's a confusion of correlation with causation. Mm. So yes, we do feel fear when we detect and respond to danger, but it's possible, uh, and research is beginning to s suggest it's true, that those are two different things, that the detection and response to danger is one thing that's very ancient, but the conscious experience of fear is the awareness that all that stuff is happening. And that's, that's a newer system. There's a, a lovely quote from, uh, from William James, or an idea from William James that, that uh, you refer to in your book, which is, we don't run from the bear because we're afraid. We're afraid because we're running. Yes, I, I agree with the first half okay. <laughs> of, of James's uh, theory. So yes, we don't run from the bear because we're afraid. But his theory about why we, why we um, uh, feel afraid is that the act of running is responsible. Now, you know, that my, my view is not far from that, but it's important to talk about the subtleties there because um, Antonio Damasio's theory of emotion is exactly that, that the, uh, the body signals from the act of running uh, are generating things that the brain interprets uh, as, as the experience. But, but for me, I think that's one part of it, but not the key part. I, what I would say is that the experience of fear is a cognitive interpretation that you're in harm's way. And the responses that are generated, for example, by the amygdala can produce a lot of uh, kind of amplification and persistence in time of those responses, but they don't determine the quality of the conscious experience. They simply kind of boost it. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, you go into a restaurant and the music's too loud and someone asks the waiter to turn it down, so they turn it down. The music has remained the same. The song has remained the same, but the, the level has gone down. And I think that's what turning off the amygdala does. It kind of mutes the intensity of the experience, but doesn't, um, you know, take away the experience itself. What I want to just put to you is that there's a sort of tension in your account, which is where you're both looking for a continuity and a discontinuity with humans. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there's this profound continuity that comes through the deep history, as you've been saying, the molecular mechanism starting with the last universal common ancestor and, and, and developing in, uh, and some of which we have in our, in our own bodies. Um, but at the same time, you you don't want to ascribe anything like human consciousness and human experience of emotion to other animals, or at least you're very, very wary of it. I'm wary of it, yes. I yeah, won't so say that. In that respect, there's a, there's a discontinuity that, that also emerges from, from this deep history, I would say. Well, you know, this discontinuity is not a, a new thing at all. I mean, this was a problem Darwin was trying to solve when he turned from his theory of physical evolution to his theory of mental evolution in his book, uh, The Emotions in Man and Animals. And, you know, it, it's been said about Darwin that he was, of course, an incredible biologist, but maybe not quite so good a psychologist. Um, he, his book, I mean, he, in the time that he was writing, and especially after his time in Elizabethan, uh, I guess, was that Victorian England? Uh, yes. There was a, that was the birth of kind of the anti-vivisectionist movement, and there was a um, there was a society for the protection of children and animals. It was all in, in the same uh, category, mm. and so there the the novel Black Beauty was you know the most popular novel around, and in general there was a tremendous amount of anthropomorphism. Now anthropomorphism in life, I think, is 
unnatural. Uh, it's been proposed. It's even an innate quality of humans. Hmm. So it's it's a good thing to you know it allows us to interact with organisms other than ourselves in ways that um, make their our coexistence um, uh, pleasurable in a sense. So we you know I go home, I pet my cat, he purrs, I think he's happy, and everything is good. But just because I'm an anthropomorphist at home doesn't mean I need to be an anthropomorphist about my science. The problem with anthropomorphism is that it's very difficult scientifically to show that an animal has any kind of conscious experience. I mean, it sure looks like they do when you see them, but that's not enough to make a scientific point. You have to do the experiment and provide compelling evidence that alternative explanations won't do the trick. I mean, Celia Hayes at, at Oxford uh, has done a masterful job of, of showing just how difficult it is in cases where people are proposing uh, certain kinds of mental states in animals, theory of mind and, and other things, that it's just really difficult to conclusively show that that is the case because there's always a non-conscious explanation that can be used. Well, by conscious here, do, do you, uh, are you talking about cognitive forms of representation? And no. More, or you, no. Do you, do you mean literally the phenomenal feeling? Exactly. Or? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, even if, let, let's just say that, okay, all these, you know, hard-nosed scientists that, that are saying it's difficult to, to show uh, consciousness in animals, okay, maybe we're correct. Um, but even if that were true, even if we are totally correct, then that doesn't mean that animals are mindless machines. I mean, we have a tremendous cognitive unconscious that guides our behavior and also guides theirs. They can do incredibly complicated behaviors uh, without the need for any kind of conscious experience. And actually calling upon the question of um, animal consciousness, for example, in debates about animal welfare, as Marion Dawkins at uh, Oxford has, has argued very uh, uh, wisely, I think, actually is bad for the animal welfare argument because it, it pins animal welfare on a problem that can't be easily solved. Um, and it's better to talk about the, the needs of the organism rather than to say that they're like people. I, I, I pulled out a, a quote which I think is expressing something that you're talking about. Behavior is not, as we commonly suppose, primarily a tool of the mind. Um, d does that sort of sum up p part of what you're saying here? You know, it's a tool of survival. Yeah. And that's what the bacteria and every organism in between has taught us. Now, obviously, there are a gazillion differences between bacterial cells and, and humans. But if we follow this, if you know, we started by going backwards. If we follow the deep history upwards, what we see is how the morphology of organisms changes from bacteria to um what's called archaea, which are the, an, another kind of um, single cell um, um, animal organism like bacteria, but the bacteria and an archaeal cell fuse to, to make a eukaryotic cell for the first time. So before that, bacteria and archaea are um, prokaryotic, but a eukaryotic cell is a cell with a nucleus where the DNA is stored, was caused by the fusion of those two cells, cell types. So uh, things happen morphologically, and then the next step was, of course, the the um, the protists, the unicellular eukaryotes, uh, then gave rise to the plants, fungi, and animals. You know, we're closer, more closely related to uh, fungi than to um, to plants. So there, there's an interesting divide in there. Um, the so and even as we follow through. Um, animals, the first animal sponges had asymmetric bodies, no particular left, right, front, back. Jellyfish type organisms have a top and a bottom, but no left and right side. The bilateral animals begin to have a uh, left and a right as well as a front and a back. And then every organism that follows has a different kind of body plan. And so body plans get more, uh, uh, get larger and, and more complicated. And to manage those kinds of body plans along the way, and in particular with jellyfish-like organisms, nervous systems come into play to allow information in one part of the body 
to be transmitted rapidly to other parts of the body to control this larger body. Because before that point, before nervous systems, the only way to control, in the case of a single cell, to be for one part of the cell to communicate with another is through chemical diffusion. And that's a very slow process. So if you're going to have a big organism, uh, it's going to have to have some way of getting information in that those distant parts. And you can't do it with chemical, uh, um, I mean, you can. Trees obviously do it with chemical communication, but their behavior is very slow. I mean, they move gradually um, with the sun or you know, leaves will slowly change with movements and so forth. But if you're going to have a rapidly moving organism that is able to do all these things the way animals do, you have to have a, a nervous system that can do that, and animals are the only organisms with nervous systems. So, uh, so I guess this this deep view brings up this this notion that uh, a lot of behavior, certainly in in many many other uh, animals, is driven by ancient instincts, ancient mechanisms. Where does cognition fit into this story? So cognition, and so cognition, I think you define it as the ability to have internal representations of the external world. That's that's the definition I use, um, and with that definition, cognition starts in invertebrate organisms like bees and flies and so forth. So they have the ability to represent information internally, but only mammals can use that information to represent um, to change behavior itself. Mm. So, so what, what's what's fascinating is that it, you know you we we can imagine you talked you've worked a lot on on fear or on survival responses, um, and something like a startle response or a fight or flight response feels like you know the heart beating and the adrenaline and whatever else the blood flowing differently to to the muscles. Um, it, it does feel like it probably is quite a quite a sort of ancient mechanism, but when we've got cognition involved. And we've got a more flexible, sophisticated way of understanding and potentially manipulating the world. D does that um, enable us to move away from just being the slaves of these ancient um, mechanisms? Yes. Or, or should we still see ourselves as fundamentally sort of anchored to those processes? And, well, I guess yes and no. I mean, we, we both have ancient mechanisms that are allowing us to respond rapidly and without much awareness of what we're doing and to after the fact as in the split brain patients to generate a narrative that helps us make sense of it but um you know it, it, there what i'd like to do if, if you don't mind is to start with human consciousness and then consider what other kind what kind of consciousness other animals might have given the differences between our brains and theirs so by consciousness, the kind of consciousness that I'm mostly concerned about in this book and in my work in general is the ability to be aware of yourself as being part of a, a conscious experience. So the psychologist Endel Tolving has called that autonoetic consciousness. It's the ability to, for the self to be part of the experience. Now, the... Um, this autonoetic consciousness is related to what Tolving also calls mental time travel. And that's the ability for you to visit your personal past and predict or uh, anticipate or project what your personal futures might be like. Now, other animals can have retrospective behavior. I mean, that's what memory is, right? So a rat or a bird can use information from the past to guide its present behavior. And some animals, as birds are particularly good at this, and, and uh, many mammals have what's called prospective cognition as well. They're able to um, use that information uh, to predict something about the future. But it's quite limited. Um, and for example, Nikki Clayton at, at Cambridge, who studies uh, prospective cognition in birds and episodic-like memories, is very careful to call that episodic-like memory because as she and Tony Dickinson, also of Cambridge, have written, we can't really know what another animal is experiencing. And uh, we don't know if they have the kinds of subjective experiences that we do. So Tolving's idea of, of autonoetic consciousness provides a kind of human specific form of consciousness that 
or at least a possible human specific form of consciousness and that that involves the subjectivity now the question then is where does how does subjectivity come about in the brain now we don't have an answer but uh, one way to think about it is in terms of um, the what's called the higher order theory of conscious awareness um, that David Rosenthal is a major proponent of and I'm an acolyte and in some sense of that I have my own version of it um, but in general the idea is that for example awareness of a visual stimulus to, to be aware of a visual stimulus it's not sufficient for that information to simply be in the uh, visual cortex it has to be re-represented in a, by a higher order state and those higher order states are in general thought to be uh, occurring by prefrontal cortex areas mm, okay so uh, I, I should just jump in this because because this is uh, in part a philosophy podcast um and i have had you know philosophers talking about consciousness this this isn't an attempt at this higher order theory of consciousness and correct me if i'm wrong here but um it's not really an attempt to solve the hard problem it's it's almost just uh, an attempt to understand in part the neural correlates of consciousness or the cognitive correlates of consciousness well that that would be more true of the global workspace theory higher order theory is an attempt to get at where the experience itself is coming from or how the experience itself is coming about now i, I don't mean to say that this is a done deal mm. i just think it's a useful point at this time given what we know to think about these kinds of uh, states as higher order states for uh, for example if the amygdala is a kind of first order um, event that uh, the, the way the visual cortex is a first order event in a higher order state then it provides a kind of you know raw material upon which to make the experience now the um one of the i think one of the problems in the science of consciousness right now is that it's all focused on perception so mm -hmm. visual cortex and prefrontal cortex the debate the debate is do we need prefrontal cortex to be aware that you were looking at an apple or not and <clears throat> some say yes and some say no um, but our experiences as we go through life are not you know apples and dots and lines the way the things that are being studied in in that work but of our memories our emotions and you know the, the kinds of things we care about in life and while we're not, uh, you know, so you might say, well, um, I mean, I've said this kind of flippantly sometimes that once we understand consciousness, we'll get emotions for free. And what I mean by that is what I propose that there's one mechanism of consciousness in the human brain and what it's conscious of depends on the inputs that it's getting. So let's say we have this higher order prefrontal network that is getting visual input from the visual cortex so that then you're aware of what the what the apple is uh, that you're seeing but if it's in addition getting inputs from the amygdala or from body responses or other systems in the brain that say well that stimulus uh, last time I ate that stimulus I got sick so you know that you now have an association that's that's more complicated than simply that it's an apple and so now you're getting inputs that begin to allow you to put perception with memory and to interpret that now as a kind of uh, uh, in an emotional way but in order to have an emotion you need a schema an emotion schema that is a body of knowledge about that particular kind of emotion so if it's something that made you sick or harmed you in some way then your quote fear schema is called upon and that's the body of knowledge of everything that's ever happened to you in the category of danger and and so forth that you've learned about throughout your life and all of the ways that you respond to danger and the things you know about the way other people respond to danger and everything there is about danger so the presence of something dangerous pattern completes that fear schema and this is at a sub at a pre-conscious level but the uh that's part of what goes into the, that that allows the experience to then be present it is what you experience consciously it's what the what working memory becomes uh, comes to work with once it's there so but beyond getting that information into the system we need one more thing to have an emotion so you can't have an emotion based on perception and memory 
and body responses and so forth. What you have to also have is uh, a self in there. So you also need a self schema. And I made a t-shirt called No Self, No Fear. Uh, <laughs> and that, you know, if you don't know that, that there's a snake that's going to harm you, you're not afraid. It's about you. Without you being in there, there's no emotion. You are. You have to be part of the emotion. So that's what Tolving's autonoetic consciousness is all about. Where the subjectivity, where your future and past come together, not the past and the future, but your future and your past come together to give rise to your experience. So Steve Fleming at UCL has some data implicating uh, the, the frontal pole in the um, in, in subjectivity uh, through his studies of metacognition. And so it's, you know, that's, that's a possible um, interesting link there. Uh, I'm collaborating a lot with a fellow named Hakwan Lau now, who is a, also a collaborator of Steve Fleming. And Hakwan is one of the top researchers in the study of consciousness and also a higher order proponent. So um, we're beginning to design some studies to begin to study, to explore uh, how these kinds of uh, dangerous experiences might come into our awareness. And the idea is that basically that awareness, con conscious awareness of an emotion is the, um, involves the stimulus, memory, uh, body signals, brain arousal, amygdala signals, uh, the self. And when all of those things come together into working memory, or, you know, working memory being a kind of metaphor for prefrontal cognition, uh, then that's when you begin to have a conscious experience. So it's an assembled state based on a lot of different kinds of information. Um, and without that assembly, you don't have the experience. Okay. So I just, I want to put to you uh, um, another quote from, from the book and see how this sort of relates to this higher order theory. So you say, our conscious mind is vain. It believes it is where the psychological action is, but we're more like a driver behind the wheel of a Tesla where we can take control if needed, but the rest of the time we can think about something else, which is that that's all to do with the Tesla having very advanced sort of uh, self-drive capabilities, right? right. Um, I don't know. I don't know how familiar people are with that in the, in the UK. I had to look up Tesla's sort of uh, self-driving uh, capacity. H how does the higher order theory relate to this idea of conscious mind being largely an observer? Well, in general, the, the higher order theory is not committed to a, an agency component at this point. I am. I, I think that, that when we, you know, that, that one of the advantages of, of having um, human emotions is that they enter into the kind of conscious state that allows us to make the next step. So, you know, if we look at the trajectory of, of, of learning, first you've got like, you know, reflex conditioning, Pavlovian kinds of conditioning. Then you have instrumental uh, learning and habits. Um, and none of this really requires consciousness. Um, and then there might be a, a sec a, another level above that that's called non-conscious deliberation that allows you to do all of that stuff pre-consciously. You don't need consciousness to do many things that we make decisions about and choose. But... You know, I think that consciousness has a role. So once we're conscious of something, it allows it, it, it brings in the entire, you know, as global workspace theories talk about, the entire cognitive apparatus that is now globally available to make decisions and do things with. So I, I do think it's important. So in an emotional situation, the presence of fear will cause you to make uh, certain kinds of um, uh, bias your direct the direction of your behavior beyond the non-conscious stuff that's percolating underneath and and is that enough for free will you do use the the, the term free will in the book um i use it sparsely I think. <laughs> yeah I, I was page 43 um i don't know if the page numbers are settled yet i got an advanced copy uh -huh. but um you do talk about it's this ability of our brains to be consciously aware of their own activities that allows us to experience fear, pleasure, and other emotions, and even to exercise free will in choosing what to do next. I mean, the, the phrase you just used there was to bias our yeah. choices <clears throat> in certain ways, which doesn't sound quite like free will, but um, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I guess nothing ever does. But <laughs> I'm kind of waffly on free will, so but, okay. but I, you know, I, I kind of believe in it um, personally, but scientifically, I, I probably Fair shouldn't enough. say that. 
<laughs> okay, okay. Let, let's say this human autonoetic self-based consciousness allowing us to have emotions and, and something like free will, but maybe not quite that, who knows, but the ability to choose what to do intentionally and with experience, conscious experience involved um, is dependent upon the frontal pole and maybe other prefrontal areas. Um, there are areas of the frontal pole that are only present in the human brain. So that would be one possible way that the human brain could have something that is not present in other animals. But, you know, we don't have to be committed to that. It's just one possibility to consider. But what about other primates? They don't have this, uh, the, the frontal pole or, or not the same kind we do. The human brain also has molecular and genetic components and neural pathway um, density across circuits and so forth that um, is, is distinct from what's present in other primates. But other primates have a pretty good lateral prefrontal cortex, dorsolateral, ventrolateral prefrontal cortex that has been implicated in working memory in both monkeys and humans. And so they have a prefrontal cortex that might allow them to have what Tolving called noetic consciousness, a kind of awareness of, you know, something is present, um, but not necessarily that I'm the one that is experiencing that thing that's present. So let's just throw that in. And then what about other mammals and birds and other creatures? Well, let's skip birds for now, but uh, other mammals, they don't have any lateral prefrontal cortex like this. They don't have dorsal lateral, they don't have frontal pole. So that, if these kinds of conscious awareness that I'm talking about depend on those systems, then they can't have what we have, just as other primates couldn't have what we have because of the frontal pole. You know, again, this may all turn out not to be true, but it, this is the perspective I'm proposing that's worth exploring. Um, and then other mammals without these systems and structures and so forth, um, that doesn't mean they don't have any kind of experience, but it's going to be different from what we have. So a rat or a mouse or a, you know, a, a cat, dog, might be consciously aware of the presence of food, of danger, of a sexual partner, and be able to act on it and have some kind of low-level, noetic, semantic kind of awareness of, of what's going on, but it will be different from what a monkey can have or an ape can have, given the more developed kind of dorsal prefrontal areas that might allow that, sem that semantic awareness to come about. Now, the semantic awareness is really what all of the field of consciousness is about. What is the stimulus? You know, what are its properties and so forth? Not about the emotion stuff, which is more the autonoetic kind. So... All these other mammals have tremendous cognitive capabilities, but you know that doesn't mean it's all the same. Darwin was asked, why are you talking about animal emotions in terms of human emotions when everything else you've talked about, you talk about animal behavior, animal uh, bodies in turn, uh, to explain human bodies? And he said, well, it's you know it's a kinder way that'll go over better and you know make it more publicly accessible. I'm paraphrasing him. Mm. I forget exactly what he said, but it's in the book somewhere. Um, and again, I think this was part of the times that he was living in. That he was, um, and he was a you know he was a dog lover. We're all dog lovers and cat lovers. <laughs> you know, it, it's not like a, I'm not trying to say animals have no experience. I'm not trying to be cruel or hard or cold about animal awareness. I just want us to be scientific about it. Mm. We can't simply conclude scientifically that something is true when we don't have the necessary evidence to prove it. So, so the thing, according to the higher order theory, that enables human beings to have autonoetic consciousness is a certain cognitive architecture, is that right? Yes, uh, you know, one of the crazy ideas, uh, there are two crazy ideas, but I'll just tell you one of them in the book, um, that emotions did not arise through natural selection. I see your eyes getting wide. <laughs> yeah, you saw my eyebrows. <laughs> right. So um, what that means is that 
you know, in the in the sense of uh, Stephen Jay Gould's acceptation. So emotions depend on other kinds of cognitive apparatus that came before them. So, for example, um, language, not language in the sense of words, but in the sense of what Daniel Dennett said when he said that, uh, you know, uh, language is the, the highways through which our thoughts travel, something like that. Um, it, it, that language changes the cognitive architecture of the brain and allows you to have syntax, which allows you to simulate in a second or microsecond who's going to do what to whom in a social situation. Other animals have to learn that through tri trial and error learning about who's doing what and so forth. Um, and in addition to um, that, we have to um, we have hierarchical relational reasoning that outstrips what most other animals have um, the ability to think in terms of levels and across levels and so forth. And I think, again, the, the architecture of language, not language itself, but the architecture, cognitive architecture of language makes all that possible. And so those things make the, uh, the ability to, um, uh, uh, what was, they were the kind of the platform out of which emotions, the ability to put yourself in that situation and to think about yourself as this entity that's having the experience. At least that's the proposal. It, it, it seems, if, if I've understood it correctly, that it would be entirely tractable to build an artificial, you know, android uh, that could meet the criteria for consciousness on the, the higher order theory. So, you know, I think that... Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of of AI speculation. I just don't know. <laughs> it's um, I don't. I'm not sure what AI. Well, I know I know some higher order theorists who, you know, do talk a lot about these AI issues, like Hakuin Lau and David Rosenthal, and I'm, they're probably better equipped to answer that kind of question than I am. Um, but in general, I think that you know, there's something you know, some perfect storm that uh, is that happened in our brain that allowed our ancestors to have a kind of uh, mental capacity that uh, is not exactly what other animals have. And, you know, it's, it, our, in a way we can say that, you know, the, this is how we're different. Um, but every animal is different from every other animal. Species are by definition different. And there's nothing necessarily better about our differences. They're just our differences, so we care about them. So that's why I want to try to understand where you know self-consciousness, self-awareness comes from, how it might make emotions. And, um, um, you know, there's one of the other criticisms that, that was made about Darwin is that the, um, um, you know, he tried to... Uh, bridge the physical gap and the mental gap in, in different ways and it was more successful I mean everybody's unsuccessful with the, the mental gap but mm -hmm. it, you know he he did his best in the times that he uh, he lived in and the information he had and I think if he had known about the cognitive unconscious he would have been less um, perhaps less anthropomorphic because he would have seen the capacities mm -hmm. that have evolved in other organisms that allow them to do things that are very similar to many of the behaviors we do. But whether they have the same kind of inner experience that we do when we do those behaviors, we, we will never know. Um, but the fact is, there are differences in our brain, so maybe it's a little different. Mm. Okay. And, and let me just close with this. Our, our main difference is that we have what we've talked about as auto-noetic self-awareness. Uh, and this is a, a right at the end of the book. This is a quote from you. While autonoetic self-awareness is the enabler of our deepest problems, it is also our sole hope for a future. What did you mean by that? Well, that's that uh, occurs at the end of the epilogue of the book, and the epilogue kind of takes things into a little bit of speculation about how human consciousness is the root of evil and the root of our worst tendencies as, as well as our greatest achievements. So it's, we, we, um, you know, we have art, literature, science, architecture, all of the, the things that humans have done that other organisms haven't uh, done. But we also have tremendous ways of, of being cruel and, and hateful and uh, uh, killing each other. And I mean, other animals kill each other, but we have you know, we develop weapons that we can do these things with in much more forceful ways and, and with much more destruction. And we're, 
you know, we're also barreling towards the, the destruction, people say the destruction of the planet. But there's a, I think um, I was, I read a, an interesting quote on this recently about we're, we're going to mess up the ecosystem with all of the stuff we're doing to the, the planet. But the earth and quoting Len Margulies is a uh, famous quote is, uh, you know, the earth is a tough bitch and the earth will survive all of this, but we probably won't be around to uh, see it. You know, species come and go. I mean, that's is, bacteria will, will make it. That's for sure. You know, <laughs> we, whether big animals like in the, when the dinosaurs disappeared because all large Bodied, energy-demanding organisms uh, had a hard time um, during the mass extinction. Mm -hmm. Tiny little mammals survived, and those tiny mammals are what led to the the radiation of the mammals that led to us ultimately. So, you know, we don't know what's coming next, and when we have changed the environment in such drastic ways, I mean, Greenland is melting every day by the untold uh, amounts. Um, it's going to change and it may not be hospitable to us. Uh, I don't know if they're, I'm not a climate scientist. I don't know if there's time to change it. I hear a lot of, you know, naysayers about that and I hope they're mm -hmm. wrong. But um, mm -hmm. in order to do something about that, we have to put our minds to it. And without our conscious minds coming to an agreement that we need to do this, we'll end up with more discard and more infighting and more. Um, and, you know, me versus you and us versus them. And we can't, uh, the, the earth is, that as we know it, will not go on if we continue along those lines. And certainly the social and cultural um, implications are, are probably pretty drastic as well for what's coming if we keep on this path. Yeah, but our sole hope is is our capacity for innovation, for imagination and for transformation. Yes, absolutely. In consciousness, we must trust. Uh, that, that's Huck Wen Lao's blog. So. <laughs> In consciousness, we must trust. Yes, that's a that's a that's a nice way of putting it. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Joe. That's a, a great, um, <laughs> a ambitious book that you've written, covering four billion years of of evolution and some of the most profound ideas. So I'll be dwelling on that for a while. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. <music>